Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. And if this is your first time to tuning in, we want to give you a very, very special welcome to coming on to the show. Wow, we are almost to 200,000 downloads and listens, and we just launched uh, about a year ago. And so we're mighty excited to how well everybody is following along. And if this is your first time in or you haven't done it yet if you're on itunes uh, be sure and subscribe rate and review so you don't miss out on this content going forward also that applies on google play you may be watching on one of our youtube channels be sure and subscribe there as well so if you're brand new to real estate investing with jay connor we talk about all things real estate single family houses commercial land self-storage you name it we talk about it the reason I'm known as the private money authority is because when I started in this business 16 years ago, I was relying on the local banks to fund my deals. But then uh, just a few short years into it, I got cut off with no notice like everybody else did back in 2008 and 2009. And I was introduced to this wonderful world of private money, which does nothing to do with local banks or mortgage companies. So I've got a free gift for everybody that's tuning in here to the show. If you're looking for more funding for your deals, regardless of what your heart money lender or mortgage broker would say, go to www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. I've got a free online class there waiting for you that'll show you the five easy steps to go from having no funding to over $2 million in funding, just like I did when I got cut off from the banks. So again, that's www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. Well, if you've been tuning into the show for any length of time, you know that I have just amazing experts and guests here on the show that pull the curtain back and reveal the knowledge that they have on very specific areas as relates to real estate investing. We talk about uh, how to find deals. We talk about how to get them funded. We talk about how to sell them fast. Talk about how to automate your business. And today my guest and expert is bringing a strategy here to this show, unlike any other guest that I've had here on the show before. So my guest, he and I are in a high-end mastermind group as well. And his name is Jan Regan. Let me tell you just a little bit about Jan before I bring him on. He's a native of Texas and Oklahoma, just like my wife, Carol Joy. And along the way, when it came time for college, believe it or not, France offered to pay for his education. He went over there, he got, he got educated in my lands. He's got degrees in physics and mathematics from France. And what he's bringing here to the table today, folks, is very, very new, at least new to me and my audience. And along with that, what you're going to be able to do and learn is about what's called cost segregation. And what cost segregation uh, in essence is, and of course, Jan's going to tell us all about it here in a moment, but what it's about, it's about having a very unique and special strategy on how you can save big time money on your taxes. And particularly with the way the laws are right now, you can save big money when you buy a property. This strategy also applies to existing properties that you own, but we're going to be talking about cost segregation and the tax advantages. Jan's uh, background, I mean, he's a builder, designer, a developer. He's done multifamily. He's done commercial properties, but I'm excited to have him on here to talk about this strategy called cost segregation. So Jan, welcome to the show, my friend. Well, thank you so much, Jay. It's great to see you again. Wonderful to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jan, you know, when you first were telling me about cost segregation, I mean, I've been in this business now for 16 years and been around housing for my lands over 40 years. And so you're talking a new strategy to me. And so first, let's just go ahead and dive in, Jan, and tell everybody what in the world is cost segregation and what does that mean? And how does that apply to us as real estate investors? 
<laughs> I appreciate the question, Jay. That's really good. You know, about five years ago, it would have been a much easier question to answer than it is today. But having said that, you know, the central thing about cost segregation really is this basic idea, this basic concept that it's really not how much money you have coming in the door, it's how much you keep at the end of the day. And one of the things that I grew up with was if you pay attention to the, the little things, the big things will very often take care of themselves, taxes being one of them. My dad was a tax guy, and he actually was the comptroller of a major oil company, and his attitude was if the government offers you a deduction to reduce your taxable income, you take it because you want to pay as few dollars as you possibly can to the IRS. And that's really what this cost segregation thing is all about. So normally what happens is you go out and you buy a property or you build one or you acquire one somehow. And if it's a residential rental property, you wind up depreciating that thing over 27 and a half years. If it's commercial property, it takes you a wonderful 39 years to get all the tax benefits of having invested all that money. And so I don't know about you, but I would really rather not take 30 or 40 years to get all my tax benefits. Well, it turns out that back in 1996, there was a big tax court case, and I won't get into the weeds unless you really want to go there, but there was a big tax court case where the U.S. tax court sided with a company that argued we should not have to take 30 or 40 years to get the tax breaks out of all of our property. Some of the things that are in this building when we buy it, we should be able to depreciate over five years or seven years or 10 years, something a lot shorter than this 30 or 40 years. And to make a long story short, the court agreed. So what this cost segregation stuff does is identifies everything in a property that will qualify for that preferential treatment. And what that means today for most properties is if I go out and I buy something, chances are I'm going to have somewhere between 20% on the low end and maybe as high as 40 or 45% on the high end of what I paid for that building being something I can deduct right now here today. So to put some numbers on it, I go buy a $100,000 house. I should be able to get a $30,000 deduction today under the current tax rules. And that's so just for 100. Is that in is that in contrast to where it was going to take, you know, 20 or 30 years without using the cost segregation strategy? That's correct. If wow. you do nothing, if you go buy a house, you know, as a rental property, you want to maybe you're somebody who's just getting started. You want to go buy this rental property. So you go buy yourself a house, you fix it up and you do whatever, and you pay some amount of money for that thing. So the way things are set up right now is if you do nothing, you're going to depreciate that house over 27 and a half years. Right. So, you know, just take whatever you paid for the thing, divide it by 27 and a half, and that's your deduction. So you'll take that amount off of your taxable income every year. If, on the other hand, you go do one of these cost segregation studies, and I should probably interject here, they're not all created the same, so you do have to watch what you're doing. But if you do one of these things, you're going to identify certain parts of that house that will actually qualify as personal property, other parts that will qualify as land improvements, and under the current rules, everything you identify that falls in those two buckets you can take a deduction on today. So like I said, if it's a $100,000 house, you should wind up with something approaching 30% or $30,000 would be a deduction. If it's a million dollar commercial property, that's a $300 or a $350,000 deduction. So as you can see, that's a pretty major deal pretty quickly. I'm getting bigger deduction than I probably have into the property to begin with. That's amazing. Do most CPAs know about this strategy and know how to employ it? Good question. Depends upon what part of the country you're in. And I would say, generally speaking, most CPAs have heard of it. And there are some who implement it on a fairly regular basis. But there's a lot of misconceptions. People think 
it costs too much or they really haven't evaluated what the pros and cons are or they're dealing with just some really endemic kinds of belief systems that just turn out not to be true. I mean, as I said, this thing really came into existence in 1996. So it's been around for 23 years. It's been tested over and over and over again. This is not some kind of loophole thing or some, you know, smoke and mirrors types of plan. It is a very legitimate tax strategy, which quite interestingly has evolved and become even more advantageous over the years. So where it used to be, we were doing this only to get the shorter depreciation periods on some portion of our property. There are other advantages today that a lot of CPAs, frankly, are not aware of. Or maybe they're not set up to go through the process with or for their clients. This is true. True. Or they don't know somebody who can do it. You know, it's a highly technical exercise. And so they may not feel comfortable or they could be just like one of my early accountants. I remember asking him when I first found out about cost segregation, what our role was, you know, what he saw our position being. And he said, quite frankly, Jan, my job is to keep your tail out of jail. And I said, no, wait a minute. I appreciate that. But if you come up with strategies, you know, that will help my business enterprise, you're going to bring them to me. Right. And he said, no, 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 no. That's not my job. And I was very shocked and surprised to hear that. He did not see himself as being an advocate or somebody who was kind of my partner to advance my business interest. He saw it simply as, I fill out the tax form, I make sure you cross the T's and dot the I's, and that was all he saw his job as being. Now, if I brought it to him, sure, he would give me his opinion. But it was up to me to bring these ideas to him, not the other way around. And fortunately or unfortunately, I have found that to be the dominant attitude of, or position, I should say, of the CPAs that we, we see around the country. That makes sense. So let's start with buying a property. Okay. We're buying single family houses all the time. Of course, we deal in commercial as well. So for example, you know, as of today, I've got two houses that I'm looking to purchase. I got a Got one down at Emerald Isle that's got an after repaired value of $750,000. We got another one here in Moorhead City. It's got an after repaired value of $350,000. So, so first I want us to have a conversation here for a moment about purchasing single family houses. So I close on these houses next week. What's the process for me being brand new to cost segregation strategy and world, what's the process for me as the owner of the company to find out, well, is that strategy beneficial for either one of these houses that I'm, these real real estate investing properties that I'm purchasing next week? Well, that is exactly where you start. You ask yourself the question, what are my intentions with this property? What are my short and long-term goals? What is my plan? What do, I, what do I expect to be doing here? And the reason you want to start with that is because as good as cost segregation sounds on the surface, that does not mean that it's going to be an appropriate fit for everyone all the time. As with all things taxes, we're dealing with a matrix of questions and not a simple yes or no type of answer. So, the matrix types of things that I consider are going to be what's the basis of the property? What am I paying for it? You know, am I paying $20,000 for this, let's say low end property, <laughs> or am I paying $750,000 for something in uh, Palo Alto, California? How long am I going to own it? What is my current tax position? I can take the same property generating the same types of deductions for two different types of investors. One of whom, already is in a position where their strategies are such they're not paying any taxes, well, giving them additional tax benefits is not really going to benefit them today, right? Because they're, they've already wiped out their income. On the other hand, I could be dealing with an investor in a high tax state where their taxes could be off the charts. And so I could have the same type of property yielding completely different kinds of results from a tax perspective for each one of these people. 
So I'm taking a look at these types of things, like I said, how long I plan on owning the property, what I'm doing with it. You mentioned the term after repair value. So the ARV concept implies that you're adding value in some way, shape or form. So right. I, I have other considerations, what I pay for it, what kinds of improvements I'm making over what time period and under what circumstances, because there's different strategies with how you implement that, which can bring in other potential benefits. Generally speaking, and this is where it gets start to get dangerous, but generally speaking, I'm going to say if someone is owning a property for less than a year, then I'm not dealing with long-term gain positions anyway. Cost segregation is just not going to be something somebody should consider. If I'm holding for longer periods, I don't want to put a time frame on it like a lot of people will want to do, but if I'm holding for longer periods, then I want to take a look at what are the tax savings that I can incur. I'm going to balance that against what it actually costs me to get the work done, you know, because a study is going to cost money. And so you look at your value versus cost, and then you make a decision as to whether this is something appropriate for you with this property at this particular time. So I know that depends on kind of answer, but sure, unfortunately sure. dealing with taxes, that's usually the way it is. Yeah, well, what was driving my question was, as you were describing this tax strategy, I mean, you know, flipping a house in six months or nine months immediately was not sounding like a fit for this type of right. strategy. But right. I mean, uh, you know, if, if part of someone's portfolio is buy and hold, right, then that would lend itself much more quickly to being a, a possible fit for this strategy. Is it worth mm -hmm. getting a study done for one property at the time? Or does it really not make sense to get the study done and, and look at implementing the strategy? It makes more sense if you have a portfolio of properties. It really works for both. Uh, you may get some advantages just because of an economy of scale. Courtesy of the mastermind groups where you and I met, you know, I may have somebody who already has an existing portfolio of 20, 50, 100 different properties. And they're in the same geographical area. And so you can wind up with some economies of scale. Your effective cost of getting the work goes down. And so your cost versus benefit ratio was obviously improved. But I've also done it for people with just single properties, which also comes into timing stuff. You can have somebody who, I'm buying a property, you've got one set of circumstances, their plan is to hold it for a while. I may have somebody who's owned a property for 10 years, or they could have inherited it 10 years ago for that matter. Mm -hmm. And so you can still do this type of work on those types of properties. And as to whether it actually fits or not, what I do and what actually a lot of people in the industry will do is a preliminary evaluation or analysis simply based on similar properties that we have done. You know, if you were to hand me a three bedroom, two bath house, that's 1500 square feet in Fayetteville, Arkansas, I have got a pretty good idea based on other properties we have done like that, what you're going to see on the back end before you ever spend a nickel before you invest tons of time you're going to have at least a minimum idea of what to expect mm -hmm. as well as a firm figure of what it costs and so i always recommend a plan for the worst pray for the best kind of evaluation good advice so if i know yeah so if i know i've got here's my worst case scenario here's what it costs for my worst case scenario and i make my decisions based on that you know, high probability of success. If on the other hand, I'm shooting for the moon, I don't know what my costs are, I would say run for the hills. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you want to avoid those kinds of things. So single properties, multi-properties, it really comes down to what's your tax position, what your interest is, and how can you use the money to your advantage? I mean, it's something to think about. If I go save $100,000 in taxes, and I don't have a bloody thing to do with it, then what good is it going to do me? Stuffing it under a mattress isn't going to help me really. And so if you have somebody who's actively engaged in some type of investment strategy, it can be pretty good. So the bottom line to your question, I think, is evaluate what's in front of you, find out what your 
potential returns are going to be, what it's going to cost, and then make your decisions based on some some sound experience and judgment as opposed to simply guessing. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So I know the focus of our conversation today has not been about commercial, but this applies to commercial properties as well, i.e. apartments, strip plaza, shopping centers. You name it. Yeah, pretty much anything. The only place that is a real tough fit is going to be vacant land. And when I say vacant land, I mean truly vacant land. A parking lot is improved property. We've done lots of parking lots. I've seen RV storage. They don't even have a paved parking lot. They put down gravel. Maybe they fenced the thing in. Even those things can potentially work. So whether it's self-storage or whether it's I'm trying to think of the weirdest thing I've ever done. I did an NSA facility one time. You know, so right. you're talking about government security clearance and all that kind of stuff. And so whether it's highly technical on one end or pretty simple on the other end, all of those things are candidates for this type of opportunity. It really comes down to what am I going to get on the back end compared to this long-term depreciation thing to what I would get if I went in Deadwood and what does it cost me? I mean, ultimately, that's really what I'm looking at. And so anyway, any type of property really will work. Yeah, it's yeah. true. We met well, with single family houses, but anything will work. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I know you've got a free report to uh, give out to all those that are interested. And the name of the report is why cost segregation. And we've got a special URL link put together for the audience. So uh, everybody, if you're remotely interested in learning and, and having your a property or properties evaluated single family or commercial, by Jan and his team, you can go to www.jayconner.com forward slash Jan, which is Y-O-N, that URL again, it'll be in the show notes as well, is www.jayconner.com forward slash Y-O-N. So before we call this show a wrap, Jan, from the time someone would contact you, by the way, if they go to that URL we just gave out, will they be able to have your contact information there as well? Sure. Okay, perfect. So from the time they would contact you, how long would, would it be for them to be able to determine if they have a property they're looking to buy or they have a portfolio of properties or they have currently have a property for you and your team to analyze really what's the turnaround time on them being able to find out if this strategy makes sense for a property or the properties that they have in mind? Generally speaking, I'm going to say no worse than 48 hours. Oh, wow. The, that's uh, fast. Yeah. As far as the evaluation is concerned. Yeah. As far as doing the work, no, it takes a bit longer to do that. Sure. But the evaluation is pretty quick. The only downtimes, you know, if you were to catch me, the week before tax filing deadlines of right. uh, March 15th or April right. might be a little bit different because people do tend to drag their feet. Right. But other than that, no, nah, I'd say 24, 48 hours is pretty typical. Okay. That's awesome. Well, parting comments, Jan, before we finish up. I, I just really appreciate the time that you've offered us. And I hope that we'll be able to serve your audience in any way that makes sense for everyone. It's been a real honor and a pleasure, and, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. And by the way, folks, Jan's company that gives you this analysis and et cetera is Safe Harbor Advisory Group. So again, you're remotely interested in learning how to save a bunch more taxes using cost segregation, go to www.jayconner.com forward slash Jan for Y-O-N. So Jan, thank you so much. And thank you, all of you that are tuning in or watching the replay. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. We'll see you on the next show. Bye for now.